Hi, welcome back to another video. Whether you do it to lose weight, to reach a fitness goal, or just for fun, exercise changes you. But while we all know that staying physically active is essential to a long, healthy, productive life, we don't often understand exactly what's happening behind the scenes. Aside from breaking down muscle tissues and burning fat, exercising causes a whole bunch of changes to happen inside your body. These changes will affect your heart, your lungs, your brain, your hormones, your skin, and most of the cells in your body. So watch till the end of this video, and I will go over exactly what happens to your body during exercise step by step. If you like this video and find this useful, please click the like button. Please leave your comments below and share this video. Hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of my future weekly video release. Please also subscribe to this channel. This is completely free of charge, but will help the channel to grow. Thank you. First up, what happens to your cardiovascular system? One of the first things that your body needs for any exercise or movement is energy. So when you work out, your body and especially your muscle cells will increase the demand for adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP, which is the only form of energy your cells can use. And at any given time, your body will only have a limited amount of ATP sitting in storage. This means that more of it needs to be created to be able to continually fuel your muscle cells. So, after quickly using up these supplies, the body requires extra oxygen to create more ATP. More blood is pumped to the exercising muscles to deliver that additional oxygen. Without enough oxygen, lactic acid will form instead. This lactic acid is typically flushed out of the body within 30 to 60 minutes after you work out. So after you quickly exhaust the small amount of ATP stored in your cells, one of the ways that more ATP is created as you continue to work out is through a process known as glycolysis. This process is what helps to turn glucose into ATP. As you know, glucose is a type of sugar found in the body and it comes primarily from the food you eat. Most of this glucose is stored in your muscles and your liver, so it can be broken down quickly to supply your cells with ATP fast. But this isn't the only energy pathway that your body can use to generate more ATP. At the same time, your body tries to obtain energy quickly from breaking down glucose. It will also increase its demand for more oxygen because that allows you to create even more ATP. This is why exercise makes your heart rate and breathing rate go up. As your heart rate increases, more blood will be pumped to your muscle cells to deliver the additional oxygen where it is needed most. In fact, your body can need up to 15 times more oxygen when you're exercising. And that is exactly why you will start to breathe faster and heavier when you work out. This will of course depend on the type of exercise you do. During regular weightlifting, your body will obviously need more oxygen than you would need during rest. But cardiovascular training would typically increase your body demand for oxygen even more, causing you to breathe faster and heavier when running or cycling. As you push yourself and your body tries to generate more energy, there comes a point where your body can't bring in or take up more oxygen. Once you have hit that point, it means that you have reached the maximum oxygen capacity for your body, also known as the VO2 max. You can actually improve your VO2 max through cardiovascular training. The higher your VO2 max is, the fitter you will tend to be, and the better you will be able to perform various forms of exercises, especially cardiovascular exercises. Not only does having a higher VO2 max help you to use more oxygen for energy, but it also decreases the amount of time it takes you to catch your breath after stopping. So if you have a higher VO2 max, you can take fewer and shorter breaks without losing your wind. On the other hand, having a low maximum oxygen capacity won't only make you breathe heavier, but it is also more likely to lead to spasms and cause the dreaded side stitch, which will further limit your performance. You are more likely to get a side stitch with a low VO2 max because when you breathe really heavy, your diaphragm, which is a major muscle that is responsible for respiration, it can become fatigue, cramping up your midsection. Now, if your heart beats harder, it helps you to circulate more oxygen throughout your body at a faster rate. This not only provides your muscles with the oxygen they need to keep functioning properly, but this extra blood that is being pumped to the muscles assists with eliminating waste products from those same muscle tissues that are receiving the oxygen. This is an ongoing process since the metabolic byproduct continuously builds up in your muscles as you exercise. Examples include lactate, 
phosphate and hydrogen ions. These byproducts reduce the capacity of your muscles to continue to contract and perform at peak levels. That is why this increase in blood flow is beneficial because it helps to remove these metabolic byproducts. Getting rid of this is great because that metabolic waste is also what gives you that burning feeling and that becomes especially apparent when performing high reps. For a very long time, trainers, scientists and almost everyone in the fitness industry believed that this burning sensation was caused by lactate. But lactate is actually not what makes you feel fatigue. So when your body uses glycolysis to generate ATP for energy, a byproduct that is left over is lactic acid. That lactic acid quickly separates into hydrogen ion and lactate within the muscles. And the burning sensation that you experience is actually caused by hydrogen ion and not lactate. Hydrogen ions do that by making the surrounding environment more acidic. In either case, having a stronger cardiovascular system and a more efficient VO2 max can help to clear out the waste that causes the burning sensation. Next, let's take a look at what happens to your muscles when you exercise. Especially if you are lifting weights, tiny tears in your muscle cells will start to develop. We call this process muscle damage and it is what gives your muscle the sore feeling after your workout. This muscle damage is especially magnified for beginner lifters. And it is also magnified when you perform exercises with your muscles in a stretched position. An example of this is the Romanian deadlift. As this exercise trains your hamstring in a stretched position, and exercises that do that typically lead to more muscle damage and more delay onset muscle soreness the following day. This actually leads many people to believe that muscle damage is crucial for muscle growth. The belief is that when you create muscle damage, your body will repair it and then add additional muscle fibers on top of it to prepare for a similar training stimulus the next time leading to muscle growth. However, nowadays scientists are more skeptical about whether muscle damage actually improves muscle growth. Currently, research indicates that muscle damage isn't required for muscle growth and it doesn't even correlate with muscle growth. In fact, excessive amount of muscle damage might even impair muscle growth, as indicated by this 2019 paper published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. So, the goal shouldn't be to damage your muscle as much as possible or to get as sore as possible, because that is simply not how your body responds. Let's now take a look at what happens to your digestive system when you exercise. Now more blood flowing to the muscles doesn't just happen without any trade-offs. One consequence of this increase of blood flow to the muscle tissue is that it pulls some of the blood away from other systems and function within the body. And those functions get pushed down the priority ladder. An example of one of these functions is digestion. So the digestive process will become impaired during exercise. That's why it is best not to consume a heavy meal directly before you work out. If you do, it will likely just sit there in your stomach, causing discomfort, gas, indigestion and bloating. And what happened to your brain when you exercise? Now, even though digestion slows down, other organs aside from your heart, muscles and lungs will also benefit from the increase in blood flow. One of those major organs is your brain, which has been shown to experience increase in blood flow during exercise. This is beneficial for a number of reasons outside the gym, but even while you're working out, this additional blood flow will make you feel more alert and focused, which helps your brain cells literally function at a higher level. Specifically, there are three areas in the brain that experience an increase in blood flow during exercise. These include the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that is crucial for learning and memory. It is also one of the only sections of the brain that can make new brain cells. The increase in blood flow leads to more oxygen being delivered to the brain, which helps to facilitate the process of neurogenesis, or the creation of new neurons in the brain. The best part is that even if you were to completely stop exercising, those new brain cells that you create will survive. This is typically not the case for many other changes that happen to the brain in response to exercise. Most of those changes will quickly fade away, not too long after you become less active. The other part of the brain that is impacted is the hypothalamus, which is responsible for a number of bodily functions, including body temperature regulation and the regulation of water balance in the body. So obviously, when you exercise, your body will heat up. It is your hypothalamus that informs your skin to secrete sweat and to release it through your sweat glands to keep you cool. 
And the third part of your brain that is impacted is your pituitary gland, which happens to be the control center of your brain. It informs the adrenal gland to pump out cortisol and adrenaline, which makes your heart beat faster and your lungs breathe more efficiently. The pituitary gland also increases your blood pressure, making you more alert, helping your body to mobilize its energy stores into fuel. It also raises blood sugar levels in the blood to give you fast-acting energy, and it informs your body to secrete growth hormones. Research shows that high-intensity interval training specifically is really effective at increasing growth hormones, but all forms of exercise are beneficial for your growth hormones. Now, when most people hear growth hormone, they think that it is beneficial from a muscle-building standpoint. But that is usually not the case. A study from McMaster University found that growth hormone is not anabolic in muscle tissues. It is only anabolic in the surrounding connective tissues like your tendons and bones. It also can help to delay muscle breakdown. So it can be beneficial from a muscle maintenance perspective, but not so much for growth. Instead, it seems that the primary role of growth hormones during exercise is to help to mobilize fat from fat cells so that the fat can be burned off for energy. And aside from hormones, exercising also triggers the release of various chemical messengers in the brain known as neurotransmitters. This includes endorphins, which are your body's natural painkillers. The release of these endorphins can lead to the phenomenon known as the runner's high, which is a short-lasting euphoric state following intense exercise. But endorphins aren't the only neurotransmitters that get released. Dopamine, which also plays a significant role in how we feel pleasure, also get elevated, as well as gamma-aminobutyric acid, also known as GABA, GABA is a neurotransmitter that has tranquilizing and anti-anxiety effects. You will likely also feel better due to the bump up in serotonin, a neurotransmitter known for a role in mood and depression. Now, what happens to your kidney when you exercise? Well, the rate at which the kidneys filter blood can change depending on the level of your exertion. After intense exercise, the kidneys allow greater levels of protein to be filtered into the urine. They also trigger better water reabsorption, resulting in less urine, in what is likely an attempt to keep you as hydrated as possible. Finally, one last thing that will happen inside your body when you exercise, that I briefly mentioned earlier, is that you will start to sweat more, especially if it is hot. Your body will release sweat to help you to cool down. This process involves the hypothalamus sending signals to the two types of sweat glands, the eccrine glands and the epicrine glands. The eccrine glands are found on the surface of your entire body and they produce an odorless perspiration that made up of a mixture of water, salt and small amounts of other electrolytes. The epicrine glands, on the other hand, are primarily found in hair-covered areas like the scalp, armpit and groin. These sweat glands produce a fattier sweat that results in an odor when bacteria on the skin begins to break it down. Well, I hope you enjoyed the content of this video. Until next week, take care. Thank you for watching until the end. If you like this video, please click the like button. Please leave your comments below and share this video. Hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of my future weekly video release. Please also subscribe to this channel. This is free of charge but will help the channel to grow. If you're interested in improving your health and fitness or losing weight, if you suffer from or wish to prevent back pain, please take a look at my book, which is now available from Amazon Worldwide. Thank you.